I thought everything was as it should be I believed that it was all up to me As if I was in control Then I lost everything I thought that I knew I couldn't see that you were leading me to Something beautiful Order, disorder, reorder over and over Order, disorder, reorder over and over It wouldn't be the way I choose But this is how you make me new So here I am, I'm Come to an end I beg you again and again To send a miracle But the storm was The way you broke my heart open wide To get to what was hidden inside And call it beautiful Ooh. Order, disorder, reorder Telling you the truth But like it or not Your love won't stop Till it makes me new So give me all that you got From the bottom to top Till I look like you Order, disorder, reorder Over and over Order, disorder, reorder Over and over But this is how you make me new Welcome to worship, everyone. Today is Sunday, September 20th, and we are coming to you from our beautiful sanctuary here in Park Rapids, Minnesota, from the Hubbard United Methodist Church. My name is Lauren Helger, and I'm here with our pianists today, who are Cheryl and Terry, and you're going to love this today. And also our, our tech team, Bill and Jeff, and our liturgist today is Liz Stevens, and we would all just like to welcome you here on this beautiful morning. You know, it's going to be a beautiful week, so I hope that you're uh, getting a wonderful start to this week. This morning, I would like to begin by lifting up all of the people, including folks in our own congregation, who have been affected in any way by the fires that have been raging out west, as well as the people that are affected by the hurricane this past week. I want to recognize and offer up prayers of hope and mercy for all those who are suffering at this time, as well as prayers of assurance that Jesus is walking with you through this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Okay, today we are going to continue on in our sermon series about hope and where we find hope and how we live into hope. And, and I just want to remind you that two weeks ago we started looking at hope in the Psalms and how do we find hope in the Psalms. And then we moved over to the prophets and, and we looked to see where do we find hope in the prophets. And today we're going to turn to the Gospels and we're going to try and see where do we find hope in the Gospels. And now I want to remind you that we have uh, set up as a definition for hope, and now uh, this, this little uh, ditty here. Now, hope is both a verb and a noun. And so I want to give you the definition again in the verb form. So this is what we gave as a possible definition. Hope is choosing to believe and act as if the future will be better than the present. It's a verb, choosing to believe and act uh, as if the future will be better than the present. And that includes trying to spread hope because, you know, once you have hope, it's contagious and you end up spreading hope to other people. Now, the opposite of hope, the antonym, is despair. So if you look up antonyms for hope online, you're going to find lots and lots of definitions, and almost all of them include the word despair. So here would be a definition of the word despair as a verb. And so it's a noun, and it's also a verb. And so the opposite of hope, it might look like this. Choosing to believe and act as if the future will be as bad as, if not worse, than the present. And here's the question I have for you today. Which will you choose to believe? I surely hope that you choose the first one. So today we are going to look for Jesus, uh, look to Jesus rather, for that hope. And first, I'm going to invite you all to rise up from wherever you are at this morning and just join me in our call to worship, will you? Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us be in prayer. Savior and friend, you call us to lay down our burdens and find rest in a relationship with you. Help us to learn from you how to be gentle and humble of heart, that our burdens may be light. Amen. Will you please join me in our opening hymn this morning, Be Thou My Vision. Stevens, and I will be leading you in the prayers of the people and our scripture this morning. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, 
you are invited to respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you are good to all. Help us to trust your word and accept your invitation to find rest in you. We pray for your church in all of its forms, that we may learn how to follow Jesus by giving rest to the weary in lives of service that are gentle and humble of heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our our prayer. prayer. We pray for the earth and all you have created and love. We pray for all those affected by human and natural disasters, for all those affected by fires and hurricanes, that all things may come back into the ecological balance that you first intended. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all people, their nations and leaders, that when the burdens of war, pandemic, poverty, and hunger are too much to bear, we may do our part to offer rest and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick, those suffering mental illness, those who struggle with moral dilemmas. Uphold them and grant them your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious and merciful God, creator of heaven and earth, we join our voices with all that you have made in blessing you and giving thanks to you, who with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit show compassion and goodness to all. We pray all this in the words of the true compassionate one saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our passages today are all in the Gospel of Matthew, the first from chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus began to announce, change your hearts and lives, here comes the kingdom of heaven. The second passage is from chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. Do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And our last passage from chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of God's word. So I was thinking about this message this week, about Jesus and the Gospels, and I thought, well, this should be pretty easy, because when I planned this sermon series, I studied the Psalms, and I went to my Bible search program, and I found every offering of hope that I could find in the Psalms, and and then I went and did that with the prophets as well, and I went through the prophets, and I found every occurrence of hope that were in the prophets, And, and I thought, well, this week should be easy, because there are hundreds of occurrences of hope in the Gospels. And so I did this, and I came up with some search results, and I'm just curious. uh, How many 
occurrences of hope do you think that are in the Gospels? I mean, all four Gospels, how many times do you think it actually appears? Just go ahead and shout it out over the internet, you know, or, or go ahead and type it in the comments. How many do you think? Yeah, if you said one, you got the answer right. One time, at least in the King James Version, I, I mean, in the Common English Version or the New Revised Standard Version, I think there might be two or three at the most. And even then, they're not the kind of verses that actually give you a lot of hope. They're just brief references to hope. And I have to say, I found this astounding. And then I began thinking about this. I mean, how is this possible that the Christian faith that is built upon hope, I mean, hope is one of the primary words along with love and love, faith, and hope. I, I mean, these are words of our faith. How is it that there aren't more occurrences of the word hope? And then it struck me that the reason Jesus doesn't talk a lot about hope is because Jesus embodies it. He incarnates it. John says Jesus is the word of God made flesh. And in the case of the Gospels, one of the primary words that we see in Jesus, in addition to hope, is, uh, is love. In addition to love, rather, is hope. And he embodies hope. And he gives hope to other people by what he says and by what he does. I mean, the entire Gospel message is about hope. And so I want us to to ponder this together, this idea of Jesus incarnating hope and how he gives hope to other people. Now, I want to start by saying that in the last couple of weeks, uh, we've looked to Walter Brueggemann, who is our great Old Testament professor, and he described these three phases that the psalmist went through and, and really the three phases that all of us go through in life. And I'm sure you remember these. Uh, he describes them as orientation, where things are going really well, and then disorientation, where suddenly things happen to fall apart a bit, and, and then we come through that disorientation and we find reorientation. So these three, we've been talking about these quite a bit, and all of us are going to experience these things multiple times in our lives. And when we look at these categories, the Psalms uh, include Psalms from every one of these categories of life, orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. The prophets, however, if you remember, they're largely focused on disorientation, and they're announcing that this disorientation is coming, and they're announcing it in the midst of disorientation, that, that reorientation will also come, and, and they provide hope that reorientation is coming. And hope comes from knowing uh, that wherever you are in the midst of disorientation, it's not going to be that way forever. Reorientation is coming. I mean, it's around the corner. And when we come to the Gospels, then, what we find is that Jesus spends most of his time uh, talking with people who are disoriented. And he's seeking to bring them into reorientation. And so this is what he does. Now, uh, last week, I was listening to Jason Gray, and you might know of Jason Gray. He's this Christian radio artist who's played across the country and around the world, and he has a song out, and it's fairly new, about a year or so old, and it's called Order, Disorder, Reorder. And it's the same idea. Uh, it's just different words. In fact, you were listening to it earlier in the pre-service, um, if you were watching. And so if you can and you missed it, go ahead, go back and take a look at that. And Franciscan priest Richard Rohr also used these words, and I think he borrowed this idea from Brueggemann. So let me just show you what he did. So he replaced orientation, disorientation, and reorientation with order, disorder, and reorder. And what we find Jesus doing is he spends most of his time ministering to people who are here in disorder and taking them then there. He's taking them to a reordered life. 
All right, so let's talk about this just a little bit. And what Jesus does in the midst of disorder to bring reorder or reorientation to us, and I want to start with the people whose lives were disordered because of their own actions. I mean, sometimes in life, our, our life gets out of kilter, doesn't it? Uh, you know, we, we find ourselves uh, just not quite right, and we end up losing track of what really matters to us. Our values change, and sometimes we allow things into our lives that just had no business being there in the first place. And when that happens, we eventually find ourselves disordered and our lives disordered. Our families and our psyches and our souls are disordered. And so Jesus is pretty clear about what it looks like to have an ordered life. And what he, when he talks about this, he says there are two commandments in the Bible that actually summarize all the other commandments in the Bible. And the first is to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and your strength. And the second is like this. It's to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So he's teaching us what being ordered looks like. And then we recognize that sometimes we lose that. And so I'm just going to show you that. a little example. So I was thinking about building blocks. And when I think about building blocks as a metaphor for our lives, you know, we, we all tend to build our lives around our faith in God. And, you know, we were created by God. We are building our lives around God, and, and we are in fellowship with God. And we're to love God with all our soul and our strength and our mind and our heart. And, and we are to love our neighbor then as ourselves. And so we are going to love God and we are just going to build our lives around God and then we're going to take and we're going to love our neighbors as ourselves. And finally, it's going to come to self. We, my friends, are third in this equation. We have to love ourselves and uh, so we love ourselves as well, but but all of our hopes and our dreams, they're built on this foundation of loving God and then loving our neighbor. And, and, and I mean, it works. Life just works this way. When, when my hopes and my dreams are built about, upon this foundation of loving God and, and then uh, loving my neighbor as myself and, and all my concern for others. And, and remember, friends, my, my neighbor is not just the people in my neighborhood. My neighbor is my friends, my family, uh, all these people in the world that we haven't met yet, uh, people we disagree with. We are to love everybody. And then, I mean, I'm called to do good, aren't I? I to love other people, to work for justice and, and kindness in the world for other people. And, and then when my life is ordered the way that it should be when I'm loving God and I'm seeking to follow God and then, I, and then I'm caring for others and I, I have concern for others, you know, then my hopes and my dreams are all built upon that. But, you know, life doesn't always work that way, does it? I mean, disorder happens. And we find ourselves, you know, always thinking about me. And when we find ourselves thinking about this, it's always about me um, and, and my hopes and my dreams and, and what I want. Me, 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 me. That's what we are thinking about. And then everybody else has to fit into that, don't they? I mean, so here's me because everything's built around me. And then... My friends and my family and my neighbors and, and everybody else has to fit into my hopes and my dreams. And we, we, we get them stacked up like this. And then God, God, of course, you know, if we still have a little bit of faith in God, that is, you know, God, God just has to kind of fit on top of, fit on top of all this. That's what ends up happening. 
you know, let's try this again. There's me, because again, it's all about me. And then there's, you know, we're just going to try and stack this up, and maybe everything will fit perfectly well, and, and God will just, you know, fit per God will just fit perfectly into my life, and I, I won't have to worry about anything, you know, but... Well, you know what, folks? never really works in life that way, does it? When everything else is just built upon me. And so Jesus comes to people who have been disordered in their lives because they built their lives upon themselves. Uh, th these people, now, uh, now they're in this category of disorientation or reorientation, and, or disorder, rather. We are talking about people who have made mistakes, who had blown it, and who had focused upon themselves as opposed to God and other people. And so the Gospels tell us that Jesus spends most of his time with a category that people called tax collectors and sinners. And these are people who had made mistakes, who had drifted away from God, and they'd done things with, uh, that maybe they were ashamed of, and, and maybe they felt like they weren't welcome anymore in God's house, and maybe they were overwhelmed or with shame or guilt. So, so Jesus came looking for those people. And as he did, this is what he said in Matthew. Matthew tells us this. In Jesus' first sermon, Jesus began to announce, change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. I mean, there is no condemnation in this. It's actually kind of a joyful statement. Usually we hear it translated as this, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And we hear somebody angry uh, shouting this, but instead you know, I hear Jesus with joy saying to the people who have been lost and wandered away from God, change your hearts and lives for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's coming. It's, it's right around the corner. It's all around us. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. You know, the word repent is what's used there, and it's a Greek word, uh, metanoia. And it means uh, to have a change of mind to change how you think. And as you change how you think, you're, you find your heart changing. And as your heart begins to change, you find your life changing. And you find your life then reordered. And that's what Jesus came to do. And so in his ministry, he embodied hope. He was constantly looking. I mean, most of the time he spent with people whose lives were disordered in this way, who, who had made mistakes, who were sinners. And, and, you know, 60 times in the gospel, Jesus talks about forgiveness. And the thing was, not condemning, he offers grace. He says, God still wants you. God knows every single creepy, cruddy thing that you've ever done, and God still wants you. God still loves you. Welcome back. Come on home. And he tells parables of prodigal children and talks about people who were sinners that, that come back home, and, and he loves them, and he welcomes them. Like Matthew himself, for example. Listen to Matthew 9, 9 and 10. Jesus, Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting at a kiosk for, collect, for collecting taxes. And by the way, Matthew in Hebrew, it means gift from God. And somebody thought that he was born, uh, that when he was born, he was a gift from God. And yet somehow Matthew drifted away from that. I mean, tax collectors were notorious for turning away from God and instead for focusing on themselves and how much money that they could make. So so Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting at a kiosk for collecting taxes. And he said to him, follow me. Now who in the world is Jesus to go calling disciples that were tax collectors? Nobody could imagine that, that Jesus would call somebody like a tax collector. I mean, they were notoriously dishonest. I mean, follow him? 
And Matthew just left his tax collecting business and he left everything he owned and followed Jesus. And Jesus later then, uh, they sat down to eat at Matthew's house. And many tax collectors and sinners joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. But when the Pharisees saw this, they had said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? I mean, this is so not okay. Why is he eating with people like that? And when Jesus heard it, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick, sick people do. I didn't come to call righteous people, but sinners. You know, friends, Hubbard Church was started over 130 years ago. I know you know that. And, and, it wasn't, and it wasn't its passion back then. Or wasn't its passion back then, rather? It, and its passion now, it, wasn't it to be a church for people who didn't go to church? I mean, we want it certainly to be a church for people who do go to church and, and to help them grow in their faith. But don't we truly want it to be a place that is open and inviting and welcoming to, to everybody, no matter what? And for everybody who walks in the doors of our church to know without a doubt that they are welcome? And, and the reason that we want this, folks, is we want to welcome everybody is, is because that's what Jesus did when he walked this earth. He was constantly looking for people. He said, I came to seek the, the lost and save those who are lost. And he's looking for people who are broken and messed up and disordered like Matthew. And he said, just come and follow me. I mean, right? That's the kind of church that we are. Everybody is welcome here. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from or, or what other people have said about you, whether you're welcome in other churches or not. You are welcome here. And I want to remind you what Jesus said. And this is our scripture memory verse for today. Jesus gave this invitation to people. He said, come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I love that. That's what Jesus is saying to you today. You carry heavy burdens, that your part, part of your life is disordered. And, and he says to you, come to me, all you that are weary. And in the King James Version, it says heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what he said to sinners and broken people and those who were disordered. You know, the thing is, the church is filled with disordered people, folks. We, we just can't see it. Everybody is broken in some way. You are, I am, every single one of us. And Jesus says the same thing to us. He says, I can reorder your life if you'll let me. It can be better than it's been in the past. Because God is the God of second chances and, and third and fourth chances. It, it doesn't matter what you've done because he wants you and he can restore you and reorder you. Now, the second kind of disorder that we think about is anxiety and fear about what's going on in the world around us. So, you know, this is a, a time of high anxiety, isn't it? And a time of great disorder or disorientation for, for people. And I mean, we've had this pandemic and economic disaster for so many and the upcoming election and the entire West Coast on fire and and floods happening and hurricanes happening and, and so we're so anxious i mean how in the world is is this world going to restart how are we going to get back to a semblance of normal what are we going to do so a lot of anxiety that's going around uh, around us and yet jesus was speaking as well in times of high anxiety. I mean, the Roman soldiers were all around and people were struggling to be able to feed themselves. People were unemployed. There were sicknesses and pandemics that came through at that time. And, and then Jesus has the audacity in the Sermon on the Mount to say this. I mean, listen to these words, speaking to the people who were disordered by fear and anxiety. He said this, 
I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And the implication of this, is, of course, is no. You can't add an inch to your height by worrying. You can't make your life any longer. In fact, your life's going to be cut short by worrying, if not, and not live longer. But, but here's how it works. I mean, Jesus told his disciples to care for other people, and he cared for other people while he was walking on the earth. So he fed the multitudes with the few loaves of bread and the fish, and, and he made sure everybody had enough to eat. And he said, listen, the things that I did, you're supposed to go and do. So he calls us to be his instruments, to be his hands and feet, to represent him Uh, to represent him. And and so when we see that there are people who are hungry, we're supposed to do something. When they're thirsty, Jesus said in Matthew 25, uh, he said this, if you see people who are hungry or thirsty or naked or sick or in prison or a stranger that is immigrant in your midst, you are supposed to help them. And so I was thinking about this this past week and about how we become the hands and feet and voice of Jesus in in providing care uh, for people who are disordered and and bringing order into their lives. And, And I was thinking about our partnership with Wellspring and how this last year, this church uh, committed uh, to a five-year partnership with them to, to provide pure, fresh, life-saving drinking water to vulnerable children and their families who are living in Africa. And I had actually a chance to visit this past week with a representative from World Vision who partners with Wellspring. And, and did you know that as of this spring, Vision's Africa WASH program has reached nearly 12 million people with clean drinking water against a target of 12.9 million by the end of 2020. And folks, we are a part of that. I mean, families have been engaged in soap making, which is desperately needed, especially now to help fight against the coronavirus. Through this pandemic, hand washing is the first line of defense against contracting viruses and diseases. And we are proud to partner with Wellspring to offer this holistic approach in helping to ensure that the spread of this virus is reduced through education and the provision of clean water. Friends, so Jesus shows up in a donated gift of water that you provide so that the people in Africa uh, can realize that the words of Jesus are actually true. And you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or where, what you're going to wear. Because there are other people of God who are, are doing okay and who are hearing Jesus say, they need my help. Go and do it. And during our offering time today, folks, I'm going to invite you to consider Wellspring as you go online or or write your checks out this week. Folks, this is how it works. I mean, this last week, I heard from one of our kids here in Hubbard who needs help in in tutoring. I mean, he needed help uh, through tutoring, and, and one of you stepped in. And another one needed help cleaning their apartment, and, and others of you stepped in and went over and cleaned it up. And and there was a young man who stopped by in need of fulfilling his required community service this weekend, and we found a way to help out with that. And others of you, you signed up for Meals on Wheels, some of who have never done it before, and they're stepping in for the first time. I mean, it's just awesome to see what's happening. Through all of these ways, we are providing hope, and we're seeking to be Jesus for these people and to say, look, He is really with you in this disordered time and in your life. And we put flesh on Jesus. We embody or incarnate hope. And what truly strikes me when I think about this is is when people find themselves in these disoriented, uh, disordered situations and, and poverty, it is how beautiful it is when people show up to embody that hope. Friends, God uses us. 
Jesus sends us to be his instruments to bring hope. And so this is what Jesus says. He says to them and to us, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. All right, that leads me to one last category of brokenness or disorder. And, and these are people who through their lives, either spiritually or emotionally or physically, have just experienced brokenness. I mean, friends, Jesus spends an awful lot of time with broken people. And I love this. He doesn't come primarily to spend his time with people who are all put together. Again, as he said, it's the sick who need the doctor, not the well. And so he's with broken people. I mean, maybe you've been broken. Maybe physically you've been broken. Or maybe you're not able to walk right now. Maybe you're in rehab. Maybe you've got cancer or you're struggling with some other physical ailment. Maybe it's your mental state. Maybe you're struggling with depression during this period of time or anxiety or whatever it might be. Maybe your relationship has been broken. But we're all broken in some way. We are all in need of healing. And Jesus comes to us in the midst of our brokenness. And he offers us healing. I mean, this is what we find in the Gospels. And so I think about Matthew chapter 8 or 9. And this is just awesome what you see. Jesus starts in chapter 8, and he's coming down from the mountain where he's been giving the Sermon on the Mount. And when he came down, there were large crowds following him. And a man came down and followed him, and, and he had leprosy. And this is a man with a contagious disease, and people were terrified at that time of leprosy. And, and so there was this social and physical distancing. And you weren't to touch a leper, and, and you were to stay some distance away. And, and they were to keep their distance, even announce, I'm a leper, I'm a leper, so, so that nobody would come in contact with them. And yet in the midst of this physical distancing, this man comes, and he falls before Jesus. And he thinks that Jesus might be able to help him, and he has hope that his future circumstances might be better than the present, if Jesus would just touch him. So this is what he says to Jesus. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Don't you just love that? And Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. You weren't supposed to touch lepers. I mean, Jesus, don't you know you're not supposed to touch lepers? And Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. And he said, I am willing. Be made clean. And the man went from his whole life through his youth, uh, maybe his life being ordered to this disorder of leprosy, to seeing his life reordered by Jesus. I just love that. And then there's a centurion, a Roman soldier, who has a servant who's paralyzed. And, and he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I hear you're a healer. I hear you can do amazing things. Would you please heal my servant? And Jesus says, sure, let's go. And the soldier says, you don't even have to come to my house. I know you've got the power. You just say the word and I know he's going to be made well. And Jesus is like, I, I can't believe the faith that this man has. Go. And you're going to find that your servant has been made well. And he continues. He goes into Capernaum and he, he goes to Simon Peter's house. And Simon Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And he, and he heals the fever. And, and then the people start coming who are sick and demon-possessed. And, and demon possession might be what we call mental illness today. I mean, serious mental illness. And, and Jesus heals those who are mentally ill and broken. And those who are physically ill. He, he heals them. And he goes on in chapter 9, and there's a paralytic that he heals. His friends bring him on a stretcher, and Jesus heals this man because of the faith of his friends who were stretcher bearers. And then he ends up healing two blind people, and a man who is mute and unable to speak. And then there's a woman, a young woman who's just died. And her parents come and say, please, what can you do? And he raises this young woman from the dead. I mean, you talk about order, disorder, and reorder. And then there's this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, and she spent all of her money on doctors, and she's not been made well. And she reaches out her hand and touches the end of his garment. 
I mean, she's thinking, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, maybe I will be made well. And in that moment, power went out from Jesus, and she was made well. Order, disorder, reorder. That's what Jesus did. Now, not everybody that was alive here on planet Earth when Jesus walked was healed. I mean, he healed only those people he came in contact with, and he wasn't promising that God was going to heal all of us during, and, and our diseases, but Jesus couldn't help himself. He couldn't help himself because he had such compassion for people who were sick and broken, and that when they came to him, he couldn't not heal them. But he was trying to say something to us. You see, Jesus was saying at the end of his ministry, look at the things that I've done. You're going to continue to do them. And I want you to go into all the world and teach them the things that I've taught and to do the things that I've been doing. Now, we don't have the same capacity that Jesus had. I mean, we're not the Son of God. I mean, I wish I could touch people and instantaneously everybody would be made well, but it just doesn't work that way for me. I do pray for healing for people, miraculous healing. And sometimes, I have to say, I see it happen. But I recognize that it's not normally how God works in the world. Friends, God works through people through doctors and nurses and researchers and people who come alongside as support for those who are sick and for those who are hurting. And so Jesus is calling us, and he's saying, look, I care about the people who are sick and who are broken and hurting, and I want you to care about them too. So our task is to come alongside those people who are broken, to stand with them and care for them. This is part of what you are doing as a church. You know, this past week I was blessed to, be, to preside over Linda Missling's celebration of life, and it was amazing to me how many of you helped me with my message, as, because I haven't known her uh, for a very long time. And those of you who were here for her throughout the years and, and praying for her and knitting her prayer shawls and visiting her and sharing her stories and poems and inspiration with other people. And, and I was able to take those memories and share them with others this week. You know, you specialize in that. Did you know that? You bring hope and joy out of the pain and the scars of our lives. And you do that. And Jesus did that too. Jesus specialized at bringing reorder to our disordered world, and he still does. He says to us today, he gives us this invitation to come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. This is what he promises us, if we will only trust him. So now you get to choose. Is the future going to be the same or worse than the present? Or do I put my life in Jesus, who came for people whose lives are disordered, to reorder and put them back together again? Because that, my friends, is our hope. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, God, we recognize in our lives so many times when we have been through this same cycle of order, disorder, and reorder. You yourself, Lord, when you walked on this earth, experienced this. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would continue to put our trust in you and to not be afraid. Help us, O oh Lord, to reorder our lives so that we can build our foundation on a love for God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and then to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And finally, Lord, when we are in a place where we find our lives broken or disordered, help, help us to remember that you walk with us during those times because you specialize in transforming the pain and bringing something good and beautiful from it. Lord, we offer ourselves to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
God's God is faithful and gracious to us. God upholds us and raises us up. Let us show our thanksgiving by giving generously to support ministries that ease burdens and give rest to those in need. You know, this morning, as I uh, mentioned a little earlier, you are invited to consider, along with your regular offering, giving a gift of hope to Wellspring to help support our commitment to them. You can give by either writing a check or uh, putting and putting Wellspring in the memo line, or you can go online to our, well, uh, our website at www.hubbardumc.org and contributing there. And as you do this this morning, I'm going to invite you to just listen to Cheryl and Terry play, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. Will you please pray with me? Compassionate God, we ask that you bless and multiply our gifts, that they may be used to proclaim the glory of your kingdom and make known to all people the power of your saving acts. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, for worshiping with us today. You know, it was so good to hear from Terry and Cheryl this morning. You know, isn't it fun to to have them back? And and also to hear from Liz Liz Stevens today. You know, I just hope uh, that you all join us um, after worship is over today because we miss you, everyone. And I encourage you next week to invite a friend to join us online, particularly someone who might need an encouraging word of hope as we search for hope then through the apostles and the epistles next week, finding hope through both adversity and opportunity. Before uh, Terry and Cheryl uh, lead us in our closing hymn this morning, I just want to send you with these final words. You know, may you just grow to know the yoke that is easy 
and the burden that is light, which Christ offers to you, and in turn become rest uh, for those who are weary and heavy laden. And may the God who feels compassion for all lead you to find the love and the peace that comes from living with a gentle and a humble heart. Peace be with all of you. Amen.